Well, thank you very much. The slides are a bit sharp. Uh, are there possibilities of lowering them a little bit? I don't know. Thank you. Um, I like to see my, my audience, actually. <laughs> if anybody makes faces, I can get back at them. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. I'm very honored and very flattered to be here, I must say. This has not been the mainstay of my talks recently. I've talked a lot more about open access in the uh, periodical area. But uh, there are a number of things that I think I can say about this uh, area as well, all the more so that I am myself, after all, a humanist, uh, so-called. And, uh, and we have to face the problems of publishing in uh, fields like literature, comparative literature being one of them. Um, I'm not going to speak so much about money. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned about the term monograph, for those, although I understand that we're coming from there, because the main line of my talk today is going to be really uh, how to forget about monographs, how to go beyond monographs, how to really make the great conversation of humanists, which is just as great a conversation as that of the scientist, how to make it work and flow as, I would say, frictionlessly as possible uh, in order to enhance our understanding of what, who we are, what we are, and where we are going. So I, I would like to, to do so. And to do so, I feel that we have to perhaps take a small step back and uh, look at this from three perspectives, which I've called the three sociologies of ebooks, but even the term ebooks bothers me in some ways uh, because there is the word books in there. Um, so about documents that are in digital formats. So I, I uh, propose to go through uh, a triple perspective, sociology of documents, documents being actually uh, you might say extensions of text plus video plus audio plus everything you can imagine on top of the text. Uh, maybe one day we'll have taste and sensations as well, but we'll leave that aside for today. Um, the second one would be what I call the society of documents. And then the last one is obviously the, uh, the obvious one, the sociology to court or knowledge of society. So sociology of documents, what do I mean there? I'm not being very original. I'm not trying to be. It comes from D.F. Mackenzie's. It really refers to the fact that to produce documents of any type, there is a sociological context which allows the production of these, uh, of these documents. From, if, Of course, it, it depends on certain kinds of technologies. It depends on certain kinds of techniques. It depends on certain kinds of communities. Uh, there is a workflow. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, it also includes the, the reception phase, how do you read that, for what purpose, how do you make sense of it, and how do you create value around it. All these things are part of what I would call the sociology of documents. The society of documents is a little bit different. It's how documents relate to each other. In effect, in effect it's a kind of sociology of documents without humans in it. It's how do, how do books relate to each other, footnotes, bibliographies, references, or allusions to other books uh, are ways of relating to other documents. Links, of course, are very explicit ways to relate to other documents. So you have this second layer that, uh, that uh, is of importance in our understanding of where we're going and where we're coming from. And finally, there is sociology itself, which is well known, except for Margaret Thatcher. She didn't know what society was, but you know, she, can be, she can be forgiven. Um, there are people, well, no comment. Uh, <laughs> then this is used for, by me to underscore something which I think is really fundamental in this. And that's why the title of the conference was worrying me a, a little bit. I don't think it's about monographs. I think it's about people who are perhaps using tools like monographs, but not essentially only monographs. Uh, it's also to uh, foreground the importance of communities, uh, at both in the sociology of documents and the society of documents. And 
Also the fact that when you have people involved in a system like this, of communicational system, a discussion system, a dialogue system, you end up having a co-evolution of both the documentary layer and the human layer. And I think we should always think in terms of this co-evolution of what we're doing and what we are, uh, we, 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 where we are going. Just as a teaser for the future of this little talk, think of the notion of an author. An author is a category of human beings. It's not eternal. It did not appear on the eighth day of creation. It's not going to last forever. We may have to deal with other forms of evaluation and other forms of creation of, of visibility, authority, and prestige in the future. And it may not take the form that the author took when the print world essentially brought to the, to the surface this kind of concept, the authorship. To summarize all this, I love this picture. I've always loved that picture. Um, I should put it over my bed. Um, it's, uh, it, in effect, it, it summarizes all I've said already. Uh, it's the humanist vision of the three sociologies. Witness, in terms of the general sociology, the gentleman keeping his hat on. It's probably cold in that room. Uh, locking his door. That's always amused me to see how he's totally locked, and yet he's obviously doing knowledge for the whole world. But that's one of the paradoxes of the uh, humanists. But more interesting is that wheel, which is like a Ferris wheel, on which the books are allowing this man to move from one book to another, so thereby threatening the integrity and the unity of the book by showing that they are related to each other. The society of text there is really at work. And uh, working uh, to create what? Yet another book, which is going to uh, end up on one of those shelves for another humanist in a different room, which will be just as locked and everything. And you see those books piling up in the back of the room with, uh, with uh, the shelves there. I'll leave aside the gears and the, the things. The Renaissance was fascinated with machinery, but it also shows, shows in, a, in a sort of indirect way how technical this is, really deeply technical it is. So when you go into the digital world and you use computers, you're just reasserting the notion that it is technical in this respect. So, so far, nothing really new here, but you know, keynotes are not supposed to be original, they're supposed to be, I don't know what, but uh, uh, I, I'm trying my best. Um, why is it not new? Well, witness the following. I think some of the quotations refer to people that are in the, in the room because Kathleen is supposed to be talking at some point in this conference, so I assume she's somewhere in the room. Uh, she writes very, very pertinently, we need to think differently about the networked relationships among our texts and among the readers who interact with them. Well, if that is not what I've been saying about society of text on the one hand and the co-evolution of the documentary system and humanity, we have it here, so my conference is over. Uh, the second one is uh, we want to examine how digital changes the process of making a book as well as what we do it with its afterwards and that's in the, the little, not so little actually, but the, the book called Book, A Futurist Manifesto that some of you may have seen coming out of O'Reilly. Now, nothing new therefore, but all the same, I'm trying to retrieve and save myself here. Uh, the way we think about books, magazine, and newspaper publishing is unduly governed by the physical containers we have used for centuries to transmit information. And that's by Brian O'Leary, you can see that between Fitzpatrick and O'Leary, I do have a, a liking for Ireland. Um, the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this quotation shows us already that we have to think beyond that little parallelepiped that really is the form of a codex in which we are perhaps too used to, to, too familiar with. So, Let's continue in this regard. O'Leary, I think, very rightly suggests in his article in that book that context really trumps content, and context comes first. And context is really the society of text and the sociology of text or documents, if you want to extend it beyond texts. So what is context for him? Well, he defines it as a mixture of elements, but I'm going to go further than that. He refers to it as tags, the research around the, the text, footnotes, other links, sources, background, metadata, 
all this in all sorts of formats. And uh, I think that's a good beginning. We're going, to have, we're going to need to go further than that. And now I'm going to give up on slides because I forgot to tell you I hate slides. And I, it, as I said, it's simply too constraining. I'm too orderly in this kind of thing, and I like to be uh, you know, a bit anarchic and, uh, and disorganized. Uh, the content in this case, I think, kills the context. Let me go on, let me go on. So we are in a situation where we're used to a very fixed system of production, and that's very familiar to all of you. We have, let's take, for example, the process of a thesis uh, a thesis a trajectory. The poor fellow, the poor lady is working, laboring away, generally very alone, especially in the humanities, um, on the thesis. And then the thesis is defended. It's finally a doctorate. She is a doctor or he is a doctor. And then comes the trek towards the publication phase. So you go to a publisher, the publisher tells you immediately a thesis is not a book, and uh, you start going back home and start rewriting to make it more palatable, reduce the footnotes, reduce the bibliography, you know all that, okay? And then, by chance, you've got a grant or something, the book is accepted, the manuscript is accepted, the book is then considered to be a assumable risk by the press, We've heard about courageous presses a moment ago. Uh, so with courageously, the press takes on that study of Zululand uh, and, and puts it into paper format, second. And then the book is distributed physically around, and then it's sold in libraries, in the bookstores, and of course distributed through libraries. And all this is extremely well defined in a series of very, very stepwise kind of things. My argument is that with the digital world, all this is going to, in a sense, uh, uh, first fade away and then being reversed, to, done entirely differently. Why? The thesis person writing alone that thesis is uh, actually emerging out of a context where a lot of the ideas were first discussed in seminars with friends in bars or on a beer, with parents, family, everybody. And the, slowly, the ideas mature and transform themselves into writing. And because of our author obsession, we still stick to the idea of having just one person involved in all of this. But actually, that person is trying to aggregate and assemble and reorganize, remix as the language goes nowadays, uh, into uh, all sorts of sources in order to create a new argument, a new perspective, a new thesis. And then we go through the steps of materializing this thesis uh, through the printing and publishing process. In the present digital system, and that's why my, word, my, my concern with the word monograph arises, essentially what we're trying to do is do that the same thing but digitally. We try to go through the same steps. We don't try to observe, as Kathleen Fitzpatrick in her excellent book, I, I want to render homage to this book, which really raises some fundamental questions. We don't look at how a book works. We look at its form. In fact, the Tenure and Promotions Committee more or less look at how thick it is and what the name of the publishing press is, and that's about it. You know. So this is not exactly a, a, a very, very uh, reliable form of evaluation, but that's what is at work right now. I would argue that it would be nice to continue, to continue the work of, um, of the seminar that started in grad school to use that particular line of investigation, and perhaps have communities of, of young, young researchers working on connected topics, beginning to work, discuss their theses without you know, hiding in a corner and writing, without, I hope they don't know what I'm writing about because they might steal my ideas. See, the notion of ownership is also, no, of authorship is also a notion of ownership. There's a very famous book by Rose called Authors and Owners. I think it puts the finger on one very fundamental problem of our present way of publishing. Uh, so you go, into, you go into a world in which the, the thesis uh, candidate, the doc, doctoral student, could start working in communities and develop his ideas exchanging more or less freely with others, the great conversation again, with comrades, with friends, with uh, uh, colleagues, and developing in this fashion uh, his or her thesis. 
one might even say, why is it so important to have just one author to a thesis? Why? Really, if you do a good piece of work, you need more than one brain. And it might be a much better work if two or three or four people had uh, collaborated together and put their brains together and put uh, together a, a, an interesting piece of, of, of work, exactly after all as uh, people do afterwards when they write articles. More and more in science, there are very few articles that are written by just one person. And, uh, more, and uh, I suspect that th the same is going to happen in the social sciences and the humanities as time goes on. This is a, a natural trend. And the thesis should not run and resist that kind of trend. There is nothing wrong with working together. There's nothing wrong. In fact, one of the paradoxes of our universities is to train people to work in a way that they'll never work uh, when they go in real work, which is where you have to collaborate with others and do elab elaborate or create teams of re research teams and work together. It, make, it makes no sense at all, but that's the way we do it. We have already examples of that. The, uh, the French uh, revue.org offers a thing called hypotheses where people can provide, in fact, the basic landmarks of their research, and uh, in fact, at the same time, staking some ground for their way of looking at things, but also calling for people to intervene and bring in, bringing in things. The second thing that we have to, to think about is that, and I think there, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick has said a lot more than I will say this morning, is to uh, assume that when you publish or write something, it's not the end of the world. It's quite a piece of hubris to say what I've written about this topic is the end of the thing. Maybe you find that extremely reassuring about yourself. Personally, I would find that very disquieting because I know I'm saying very stupid things and, uh, and I wouldn't want that to remain the, the eternal legacy of humanity. I mean, that would be, uh, imagine that going into outer space and being met by intelligent aliens. Oh my God. And so let's, let's, uh, let's be honest and modest. We're writing what we can about a topic we know a bit about and we're trying to bring our stone to this edifice, which is no human knowledge. That's the essence of the exercise. The essence of the exercise is not to produce objects called books with authors and who have rewards like a promotion. No, this is a kind of currency and system of, and economic, symbolic economy which has nothing to do with the essence of the project, which is really how do we do the research work? How do we communicate together better to create good research, which is good for the common good, for humanity, for all of us, and for our own work. So we move in this direction with the idea that the text should be obviously amendable, it could be transformed, changed, it could be corrected, added to, and so on, it could be commented, of course, and leading in this fashion to the creation of not, not a thing, but a community. So you come from a community, you work through that community to create a current of discussion. That current of discussion feeds back into this community, and of course it reshapes the community, and then this kind of back and forth movement between the flow of ideas and the flow, the flow of the people involved uh, remains like a, just one stream in the long, big river of thought of humanity. I think that's far more exciting than our very clumsy, uh, I'm looking for the English word for the French saccade. If someone knows the word in English, please shout it. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of step-by-step step and in a very boom, boom, boom manner. Um, you, have the, uh, you have this system of you produce a book, it takes many years, then it takes many years to be really assimilated by others, and then it takes many years for someone to say, no, that doesn't work, I'll give another interpretation to that, and then everybody gets excited, oh, a new Michel Foucault has just, just undermined the whole of history, whoopee. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then someone comes along and says, well, you know, Michel Foucault is full of your dot, dot, dot. And, uh, uh, but in a very, like this, it's not a discussion. It's like everybody showing, look how beautiful I am. Look how what a big peacock I am. And let's see who can shoot me down. Doesn't make sense to create knowledge. Or I don't think that's a very good incentive to the creation of knowledge. So let's move on to this notion that perhaps the texts should be uh, on the course, 
on a trajectory, and that in a sense begins to resolve the issue of publishing, a publication. Maybe the kind, the quality of the dialogue going on would then lead to questions like, what is the best form for that discussion? Because it starts being really damn interesting for much more than that little community. It's starting to extend to more people. Maybe more people should get involved. So how do we move from this level to that level to that level? In other words, what I'm saying is that if you want to create a book, rather than taking it as the starting point and then you know, doing everything to do it digitally uh, in the best possible way and putting, uh, again, content over, over context, as O'Leary says, um, maybe it would be more interesting to raise the following question. At what level of the discussion between a number of interested people should we go to the form of publication that traditionally we've called the book? Does it have its place in that particular conversation? If so, in what kind of circumstances does it make sense to do so? If you're writing about Zululand, it might be much better because it's indeed very expensive to produce a book. It might be much more interesting to start having the 20 scholars getting together and really putting together everything they know about Zululand. And there again, you know, it would solve another problem which has been alluded to in the introduction, the question of the relationship between what is published and the, the data that's behind the publication. Right now, and I've witnessed that many times, archaeologists, art historians, whatever, uh, they have collections of photos, of objects, and so on. They sit on them. That's their treasure trove. They have to exploit that. The physicists do the same with their measurements. The chemists, the same. And they sit on that, and they try to exploit that to the hilt. And meanwhile, no one can look at it. No one can verify it. And we are getting interpretations of all that from one team or one person. And it's uh, obviously a very flawed way of, of producing knowledge. Had these no data, had these, these issues uh, been solved uh, in, in terms of publishing them, I think we would get to a better, a better result for the production of knowledge. Yes, but there is one big problem in all of this. I'm going back to the author. We have a way to reward people symbolically, and then their symbolism is translated into other things, you know, like my being here today, this nice translation of whatever fame I may have acquired in doing whatever stupid things I've done in the past. And uh, so we, we like that. We have, a, we have an economy of prestige, an economy of reputation, which, of course, works for us. And what I'm talking here is on the ideal plane, in a utopian mode of thinking, uh, is something that really uh, looks good, but what kind of entity, what kind of social entity do we have to create to make this kind of system work? I'm going back to the notion of author at this point. And we may have to rethink that notion of author very, very deeply. I don't have good answers on that, but I think that's what we should be working on. But I'll provide at least the beginning of a possible model I'm fascinated, and I've been long fascinated, by the way uh, free software has been working and evolving for the last, last uh, 20 years, 30 years. 30 years, actually, if we go back to Stallman's early, early uh, interventions. And uh, what I find in that is when you look at the source code of software, you know who did what. You know who did what. You don't know who... You don't have generally, or sometimes you do, but most of the time you don't have the list of all the people that introduce something into the code. But when you look at a specific piece of code, you know who did what. And you, do, you know who did what for two reasons. Visibility, of course, with prestige and authority and all that, but also responsibility. That is to say, if you put that code into the thing and it really creates you know, a disaster in, in uh, whatever this software is supposed to do, uh, you, end up, you end up having uh, to know who was responsible for that. When we create knowledge, we have to be responsible for that knowledge, so we should be identified. Actually, that's how names appeared in printed books at first, by the way. That was the reason for that, that the very first reason for the production of authors or authors' names 
people that were responsible in front of the king uh, for whatever content was in there. But at the same time, it was also transmuted into uh, visibility, authority, prestige. So we have to, I think, rework very carefully uh, the uh, whole notion of value, the whole notion of uh, visibility for those who intervene in that. And I think again in that, and uh, I will quote again or I'll refer again to Kathleen Fitzpatrick's book, I think her way of entering into the whole problem by really examining the peer review process is really one way to tell us that we have, we really have to rethink the way we create value in research. Right now we do it as you all know, through books, presses, and uh, the logo effect of, of all these things, uh, we have to rethink that and we have to find a way to reward uh, the individuals that will intervene into this field. And I think that's, uh, that's our big, real big issue. It's not a question of finding which kind of format we'll do. The interoperability issue is important. The DOAB is a wonderful tool and I will sing its praise until whatever, I, I can do it. And uh, uh, the, all, this is, all this is very, very real and we have to, to, to think about all these very, very pressing questions that are around us. But if you look about the midterm and even more the, the long term, it is how this new system of communication, which is made possible by the digital age, is going to fit within our so society and within the sociology of texts. And of course, what kind of society of texts or documents is going to create. And these were the thoughts I wanted to share with you this morning. So thank you very much. Take a few questions. Sure, sure. Um, thank you so much. And we've, we've got a few minutes for um, some questions and points for the floor. So um, anybody would like to uh, 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 come in with a comment? Don't be shy. <laughs> I don't bite. Anybody? Hi, um, yes, go ahead. I like your ideas very much, and I think uh, we both shall not embrace the way you think uh, that we open up books and open up um, the whole, yeah, the question of authorship and everything. But I get the feeling the longer I am in this whole debate and the longer follow it, I get the feeling it's very interesting for young academics that need to build up a reputation, it's much harder to fight this through. And I sort of observe that the, the, the roles here are sort of the older people say, oh, why are you still producing books? Why are you focused on monographs? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a constant law of nature that the most fragile are also the most conservative. That's, uh, it's, it, there is no way to escape that. And for example, in the issues about uh, publishing in open access and, uh, and, uh, and trying to find ways to, to, to really reconcile your practice with the demands of the grand conversation, uh, people, for example, in my age are much, much better much better situation than a young scholar. So I think it behooves to the, the likes of me, the old farts of the ac academe, uh, uh, it really, uh, to, to really confront that and certainly not encourage our younger, our younger colleagues to risk their career on this thing. If we want to modify the tenure and promotion uh, processes of our universities. If we want to f change the, uh, the way we create symbolic value around research, and if we want to def define otherwise in different ways the notion of uh, prestige and authority, uh, it is for people who are securely in the system and who understand that the system doesn't work well, especially now that it is being, anyway, it's being challenged by the very nature of the new technologies coming into play. Thank you. One more before we go on to our panel. Front there, Sally. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was extremely elegant. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'd like to take you one step beyond your previous answer. How, do you, how would you see that rolling out in business? So going beyond acad academia and academic careers, how would businesses manage this shared knowledge, this shared contribution? <laughs> there you're raising an issue where we, we may have some real differences between us. Uh, for those who are on the business side and those on the academic side. Um, I am a firm believer that the grand conversation, as I like to call it, uh, is 
part and parcel of the research process. Research processes, excuse me, are supported largely by public money. A lot of the research is supported by, by public money. In the case of the humanities, we shouldn't be fooled by the notion that the grants are much lower than in the, in the sciences and technology. We also have, of course, all the acquisitions of books and journals by the libraries, which are really our lab laboratories. I mean, we, we should think in, in those terms. So if we put, if we put the, uh, the research in that perspective, as the publication phase as, in that perspective as part of the research process, and if we understand the res that the research process has never been sustainable in the commercial sense of the word, it's being subsidized at least ever, ever since Charles II in Britain with the Royal Society, but probably way before that when Rodolphe II in Prague was subsidizing a bunch of alchemists, he was already doing a strange form of subsidies for, for science, but he still was doing that. Uh, if we believe that, then I, my answer is that uh, then the research publication phase should be subsidized like the rest, you know. And then it says something which, um, uh, of course, may not be to the liking of more commercially oriented people, which is uh, then the, the university presses and the libraries together, as it's coming to, uh, happening now, for example, at Michigan in the United States, um, ha are in the perfect position to team up. They have the complementary skills, essentially, to, uh, to produce these texts and make them evolve on the kind of uh, way of the cross, you know, you go through all the different steps until you you're, you're reach some sort of catharsis at the end of the, of the process. But what I mean by joking like this is that texts can improve, evolve, uh, and at some point reach perhaps certain plateaus of significance, long-term stability kind of text that could be invented as it is done in the, in the software world, which could be the equivalent of the monograph, but a monograph that would be very clearly marked as being a transitory plateau, not as an object which is fixed, rigid, and forever. So, you know, from that perspective, I have very little to say to commercial publishers. But if commercial publishers want to enter that game because they like those fields, they are courageous people, they want modest gains from it, you know, and do it, do it in a, what I would call, broadly speaking, in an honorable way, not a predatory way, as some publishers do. Uh, wonderful, because I think the commercial publishers in this kind of field uh, have one advantage over publishers, uh, academic presses, and libraries. They may have more of an incentive to try innovating. Uh, so that will be the kind of, you know, the pushing of the thing to make the, the, the machinery move forward a bit better, a bit faster, and so on. But I keep my eyes focused on the grand conversation, its objectives, the people involved, and then the tools to make it work are ancillary to that very, very basic task. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.